on camera. Okay. Well, good afternoon. This is uh, uh, Monday, December 4th, uh, 2017. Uh, I am Dr. David Taylor with the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. With me this afternoon is Sue Verhoff, who is the Director of Oral History and Genealogy at the Atlanta History Center. We are here at the Atlanta History Center today to record the oral history of Dr. Mariba Kelsey, who served uh, in Vietnam. In World War II. World War II, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he was going to give us his uh, uh, observations uh, about uh, being in the military and uh, his life perspective uh, as it were related to, to that and other things. Um, Dr. Kelsey's uh, oral history has been recorded for Asella, um, who is in partnership with the Atlanta History Center, Veterans History Project, and the Library of Congress. And we are honored to have you today with us, uh, Dr. Kelsey, and thank you for participating uh, in this project. Uh, to begin with, I need for you to state your full name um, for the record and uh, the date of your birth. Okay. Well, I'm Richard C. Kelsey. That's my birth uh, name. I was born 1925, June of 1925, so I've just passed 90. And uh, the, uh, uh, born, and I grew up here in, in uh, Atlanta. Grew up in the Pittsburgh community of Atlanta, uh, for, uh, which I'm very proud of. Sorry to see that how uh, it has been uh, deprived of its natural growth, but but certainly glad. Uh, uh, I still take great pride in that community, and I still work in that community. I remained there for for um, about 15, six, 15 to 16 years, in which I. Um, after that Could time. you tell us a little bit about your parental background? Oh, uh, my, my parents, my parents, uh, uh, my mother was a, a um, teacher who retired, who, when she got married, retired from teaching, uh, except for teaching her <laughs> children and, uh, and, and sort of teaching in the community. And my father was a plasterer, uh, which I'm, I often say to people, many of, the, many of the downtown buildings my father worked on as a as a plasterer, uh, in fact, my daughter, who is a physician, was having a meeting at the Hurt Building, and I said, "A oh, Hurt Building?" Also, oh, that's one of the old buildings that my father worked on, and uh, it may not even be in the same place because it must have been in the 30s or, or thereabout when he worked on that. But uh, but he worked on Grady Hospital and many buildings uh, like that. But much of, many of the downtown buildings, old riches and and uh, buildings like that, that my father worked on. So, um, and they met when? And they met in in 1922, I believe, and were married in 1924. Okay, here yeah. in Atlanta. Oh yes. Okay. Yeah, here in Atlanta. Um, in fact, my mother is kind of interesting. I don't know the details of where they met, but I know that they were from the same county, Washington County, Georgia. Mm -hmm. So I assume that uh, they must have met somewhere in Washington County. But my mother was teaching in South Carolina. And uh, dad, my dad had been in World War Two, I meant World War One, and uh, he came back and came to to Atlanta to to work as a plas well, to work as an apprentice, I believe, at first, and then then later as a as a plasterer. So the details of exactly where they met, met I don't know, mm -hmm. but uh, but but uh, what I recall is that uh, on Mary Street uh, we lived for. I was told that we lived for for about a, a year, after, uh, nearly a year after I was born, and then on 927 Well Street, where the where the uh, Gideon School is right now, uh, is where my home was for 15 or 16 years. Okay. So uh, on my growing up. And how many siblings did you have? I had um, a sister uh, uh, who was younger than four years younger than me. Mm -hmm. And I had a brother that I didn't know I had uh, until uh, I was maybe four or five, and and that my father had that was my father's son uh, before he was married, and uh, and so we didn't. He he remained in Washington County 
uh, a while. So we never really got to be close until uh, until uh, we were adults. Mm -hmm. And uh, he went to Washington, D.C. and, and worked uh, there in the interior, Department of Interior. And uh, and my sister, uh, who not, both, of, both of them are now deceased, but um, my sister was, was a social worker, and she, so she worked with the, in, the, in the area of social work for, for many years. Could you give us a little sample of your family life? What was it like as a young man growing up? Well, you know, it, um, Pittsburgh was an interesting um, a community in that it was 99.9% .9 black, and it remained that way for over 100 years. And uh, and I've I've kind of dedicated my life to ma making sure that legacy is remembered, and so much of the, uh, I, uh, Fred Cleveland has published three books that I've written about uh, the Pittsburgh community, and uh, the uh, so, uh, so as I grew up, that community, anybody who was there was nobody who almost was unemployed, they were employed by somebody, either in the community or outside of the community. If you were unemployed, I only knew one person who sat on the corner unemployed, and, and uh, whose name I could call right now. <laughs> and uh, and it was not looked upon as being very uh, uh, favorable by anybody to be unemployed. So everybody found, you know, I say it out. You may not call it employment, like they had. I say they had some kind of hustle where they made some money to keep take care of their family or themselves, uh, which was a very and and this, the uh, the uh, rules of the community were that if you if you harm somebody in the community, you would be ostracized. That was one of the rules, and therefore, therefore, they, um, there were very few. Uh, now there were fights. I don't mean to say that there were none of those, but uh, but if you stole somebody, if I stole a woman's purse, if you were in, the, we had a lot of sandlot teams like football and baseball and so forth. You would not be chosen. Mm -hmm. You would not be chosen to be on the team. So that 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 was reduced by that. It is too bad that they we don't have some of those same uh, internal rules uh, that in our communities. Uh, what, what were some of the uh, guiding principles? What were some of the um, forces that kind of shaped your character when you were young? I'd say neighbors. Neighbors, okay. Um, uh, we had a, there was a church, Rice Memorial Presbyterian Church that was about a block away that had, had a pre-kindergarten program that, uh, that helped us. Uh, and there was a lady whose name is Chappelle, whose name I remember very clearly because she always uh, 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 helped shape. And the next door neighbors, I mean, you, if, uh, if you, uh, I'll give you a little uh, anecdote, I guess it is. Uh, I was on McDaniel Street once and in some kind of little devilment, and uh, some lady said, aren't you that Kelsey boy? And I said, oh my goodness, busted. <laughs> and uh, it was that kind of uh, experience that helped shape. So you knew that no matter where you were, you were supposed to be uh, uh, watch your P's and Q's because uh, if if somebody identified you, you were, you know, it was just you were just out of luck. Yeah. So uh, uh, it was those kind of n norms or or uh, uh, guiding forces. So so the parenting existed far beyond the household, mm -hmm. far beyond the household, and uh, and it, it's too bad that the public policy ex that exists now doesn't allow that to happen very well. And in fact, if I had to uh, to uh, move some one pub one element of public policy, I would insist that that be changed, mm -hmm. and that but there be some training for mm -hmm. our communities so that uh, so that that same kind of phenomenon can exist today. I resonate to that because I was brought up in a community where you were a community child. That's right. And whatever happened got home before you did. That's right. <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> oh, oh, that means I, I could give many, I could give another one, just I was two blocks away from home. So it wasn't long before I could get home. Got into a little tussle with a guy and, and his nose started bleeding. I don't know whether I hit him in the nose or not. But anyway, when I got home, my dad was waiting. Now how how he got word of it I do not know until this day, but he was waiting. 
So I, so, so I know that you're quite right about the, this community, uh, uh, folk ways, no ways, or, uh, rules, or uh, behaviors. Um, transmitted over airways that didn't exist, <laughs> that we call telephones and whatnot now. <laughs> I, uh, coming from the conversation, I picked up on the fact that your mother was a, a teacher. Right, she okay, was. And I don't know what your dad's educational background was. Well, as far as I know, my dad probably didn't go to high school. Okay. But, uh, but he, would, he knew that building business. Okay. So, um, I'm assuming that in the household, that education was stressed. That it, was, it was very important. In fact, that, uh, in fact, no. In the block that I lived in, everybody was expected to finish at least high school. Everybody. Now, not everybody finished, so I don't want to leave that delusion. But everybody was expected to, and everybody was helped, and everybody was rewarded. In fact, uh, there were celebrations when when uh, when people finished high school, and. Uh, and if you came, and every year you came back from college, there was some kind of recognition going on. If, if it's no more than going to the corner store, and the guy says, "Man, I'm so glad you were successful. Here's a dollar." Mm. You know. Now remember, I'm talking about 1930s and mm -hmm. 40s. A dollar was was significant. Uh, so so you had those reinforcers that that uh, encouraged you to to continue. Okay. Yeah. Could you trace your educational background for us? Beginning with your high school and then uh, going well, forward. Well, I was I was one of those rebellious people, I guess you'd call me, and that uh, and that I got to high school and I, I was in eleventh grade and I decided that that I wanted to get a trade. So I, mm -hmm. NYA, the National Youth Administration, which some of you may, may know that uh, that that acronym NYA, I became a part of the NYA, mm -hmm. and uh, and which. Which held its courses on old, old uh, its early courses on on old Clark's campus and at Crogman School, mm -hmm. and uh, and I was, so I got training in in drill press and machine operation and and uh, welding those three, and and from there I went to to uh, Connecticut, and got advanced training and and began my my career really as a as a um, uh, in, first in the foundry and then in a, in a, uh, a tr uh, trunk part uh, cutting uh, f uh, factory, and then later to aircraft, to, uh, to aircraft in Hartford, Connecticut. And uh, so I worked as a drill press operator and, and uh, OD grinder, uh, grinding gears for air, airplanes in, in uh, Pratt & Whitney. Okay. Yeah. So, but, I'm, I'm but, 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 so now, now I'm 18. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, now I'm 18. That's what I'm getting to. Okay. And the, so, at 18, uh, it, it, uh, the big issue of uh, of uh, black going to Tuskegee for piloting became uh, that came to my ear in Hartford, and so I decided that that was going to that was be, that was something I wanted to vo to to volunteer for. So uh, I. Uh, in the, about, about July of 1943, I went to, uh, I came back to Atlanta to volunteer to go to Tuskegee, mm. but you had, couldn't, you, it wasn't a straight line volunteer because they had the quarter at that time mm. of who, who would be there. So it, they, they advised me to, 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 uh, uh, to be inducted into the Army, which I did, uh, and the Army Air Corps. It wasn't the Army and the Air Force were together then, you know, because they were called the Army Air Force, Air, Air Force Corps. And um, uh, and we, I went to Fort Benning, and there at Fort Benning there, were whole, there was a whole uh, slew of us who had the same ambitions. And so we took exams and whatnot, and, and uh, many of us passed them, and they created a category that I can find no reference to until this day. It's called a pre-aviation cadet, PAC. And, uh, and, and they, then they scattered us across the, across Kiesel Field, MacDill Field, Tyndall Field. And so uh, I, while I know that there were many men, many men in, uh, in that category, PAC, I don't know how many, 
But I also know that n none of us who went to Tenderfield, where we had a squadron that I can't remember what the name of that squadron was, uh, that none of us got, ever got called. And then we was, so we was, I, I told Fred that we were kind of in a holding pattern there to a waiting assignment. And so we had many different uh, uh, tasks that we did, none of which lead, would lead us to Tuskegee. But let's step back then and okay. dissect this a little further. Okay. As they say, delve deeper into this. <laughs> okay. Um, so you went into the military right. in 1943, right. midway through the war, as it were. Um, August. You're, you're, it was actually August. August. Yeah. Um, a, a young black man. Mm -hmm. um, the military at that time was segregated. segregated. Right. Okay. And so wherever you went, I, Fort Benning, Georgia, I assume, had white and black separation? Right. Okay. And they had a section where the black men were into, uh, uh, inducted, mm -hmm. uh, a section where the white, white were inducted. Okay. They were separate. And you trained separately or you trained together? Se trained separately. Everything, everything was separate. separate. Okay. And so uh, you were assigned to um, do what before you as a pre whatever. Well, it was kind of funny because when they, when they scattered us like that from, from uh, Fort Benning, we had no assignments. We were just put on bases and, uh, and wherever we fit in. Now, so, so tasks ranged from the cleaning of engines to uh, uh, if you, we, I became fairly skillful at, at Auto, uh, in, uh, airplane mechanics uh, to uh, to learn to be. I, I became expert. In fact, I have expert on a, a rifle and 30, 50 caliber machine gun. So I, I became an assistant teacher. Okay. I couldn't be a real teacher. See, real teacher. Uh, so uh, so I assisted on that. So there were there were uh, that that was, now now we at Tyndall Field, now Tyndall Field, Florida, and Panama City. So, uh, but uh, it's kind of interesting. But none, of, I, I, I have, the, I have the expert medals marked, but no, on there are no places that indicate that I was working with thirty and fifty caliber machine guns, which are aerial machine guns. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'd say to people, let's be. The story is not told. Those are some of the unknown stories that were told. For example, another one that's uh, that I think is might be of interest in. Uh, is that there were race riots, race riots on the military bases that uh, that we didn't uh, that, as far as I know, never got publicized in in the media. Was there one on? Not, there was not. There was not on Fort Benning that I'm aware of, but there was one on at, down the street, down the road or piece at Gulf Fort, at mm -hmm. Gulf Fort Air Base. What was the? I, I don't know what. The, I don't know what the precipitating factors were, but I saw the results in terms of the barracks, barracks being torn up. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, and everybody denying. We, uh, uh, at that time, I was I was uh, those of us who were in the PAC on down the Tyndall Field. We were kind of in a holding, so I ran track for the for the military. So I was on the I was on the way to to Xavier relays, and. The, I don't know whether all this is appropriate or not, but but um, we we're on the way to Xavier relays. Xavier. Xavier, yeah. Okay. Relays for the races. That's right. Just for the record. Yeah, <laughs> and um, for the yeah track meets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, and we got to the the, the uh, New Orleans airport, and because we had only black men on the on the plane, the airport the, the uh, New Orleans airport would not uh, admit the, give clearance. So we had to go back to to Gulfport. That's how I happened to land at Gulfport. I I was not I had no connection to Gulfport other than that. Mm -hmm. We landed at Gulfport, and they took us over to the to New Orleans from there. So uh, so the, uh, uh, and that was my first. I ran in Xavier Relay a couple of years, but mm -hmm. that was my first year running in, in that in that relay that race, mm -hmm. uh, that meet, and uh, uh, but. And so we were picked up from the airstrip and taken to the dining hall. We weren't allowed to stop because the barracks were all destroyed. Windows were burst out and all along the way. 
and um, and we asked what happened, and nobody had, had an explanation. Mm -hmm. But we learned later from some of the men that we met that uh, that had been raised right, and they had vacated the their base. Mm -hmm. Which and and today, you know, that there's that great mystery that we need as as African Americans. I think we need to look into. There's there's not an easy finding of a Gulfport Air Base, and part of it is because of that that thing that happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me back up again. Um, you're in a holding position. Yeah. You're not quite in the military, but you have skills. Well, I'm in the military. Okay, okay. I'm fully in the military now. And then, <laughs> um, but you weren't, and you had gone to Tuskegee yet. You no, your, no, okay. no. So how long was that status, or did you ever resolve the status? Well, the resolve was, actually we became, I, I, I don't know what the reason was, mm -hmm. but I think that we became where we were not um, beneficial for them to keep us there at the Tindal Field. So they transferred us to, they, they split us up and transferred, I, and maybe 10 of the men, we had a, hundred, a squadron of 164 men. Um, the uh, 10 of those went with me and I went to, we went to uh, Ogden, Utah, where we would then disperse to, uh, to uh, Richmond, uh, California, to go to the, to the Pacific uh, Arena. Okay. So um, we went to, uh, we went, and they really didn't have a place for us. The reason I know that we didn't have a place for us, we stopped in Honolulu and stayed there for 30 days doing nothing. Hmm. And uh, th after about 30 days, we got on a ship and started out to, to the Philippines. And uh, in the Philippines, I do know that, I guess to some extent, I washed out of my brain, I think, that's what I have to tell. I washed out of my brain the name of the unit at Tindal Field because I can't remember that to save my life. But we did go to where, where we did do, uh, use some of the skills that we had. We, went, we were assigned to a, a 1964 Aviation Depot Company in the Philippines, and uh, where I learned to, to, uh, to uh, uh, categorize uh, materials and, and move, learn to move them about and so forth. So, which I consider to be a valuable skill today. Mm -hmm. um, the um, um, and I stayed there. I stayed there. Well, you asked me. You asked me where, how long did I stay at Tindall Field. Let me back up and say I stayed at Tindall Field about six, uh, about fourteen months. Mm -hmm. About fourteen months. And I, and I noticed. I'm saying that in a holding pattern. Mm -hmm. That's what I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, uh, we were at. Um, in, uh, at Honolulu for uh, 30 days, so that's, nine, that's, that's a total of 15 months, right? And, and so we, then we went to uh, Manila and we stayed there for, rest, for the rest of my uh, term in, in the military until I came, to be di came back to be discharged. So when, when you were in the war theater, as yeah, it were, in the right. Philippines, um, was uh, the policy of racial separation still in separated. force? Okay. Everything was separated. Everything was separated until um, uh, the uh, order from President uh, Truman. Pre Tr yeah, yeah, to President Truman, uh, which gave that was right at the beginning of the 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 uh, uh, Korean mm -hmm. War. So I got called back by, since I was in the training, they considered me to be in the training command. It's really interesting because I got called back, but I only stayed about a month in the, uh, when the Korean comes. I got called back to, to, to attend the field, I mean not to, to Kiesler Field, to uh, be a part of the training command. Well, when I landed, when I uh, was there at that base, now, now, this, now we're updating now to, to Korean. Um, I was to, to, to be a part of the training because I, had, I remember I had expert in terms of gunnery and so forth, and so that was what I was what I was the I think they intended for me to do, but I got discharged before that. But uh, the first night that I was on that new back at Tindall at uh, Kiesler Field, the uh, that was the master sergeant 
who was directing us to the barrack, and uh, and and his language was not as uh, uh, clean as as it, as, it, as it might be. But he was he was really trying to carry out the order that we were the, everybody was to live in the same barrack, and some of the white uh, young men who were there for the, in the military for the first time. They were refusing to go. He said, if you don't want to go in there, sleep on your ass out here in the, in the, in the, on the ground. And many of them did for, about, for, for, um, for a period of time. But about, after about five days, they all kind of began to move in and, and begin to eat. They didn't want to eat in the same. Uh, so, so the military, in that way, the military forced uh, the order uh, forced uh, some degree of integration to begin to take place for the first time. So did you have white officers over black troops or black officers or black troops? There were no black officers beyond the ones that you know have been, been popularized mm -hmm. at one, for, the, for the Army Air Corps now. Mm -hmm. Now in the, in the infantry there were, there were some, but uh, for the the experience that I had, I never had a, I never had a black uh, officer, had a sergeant. Mm -hmm. I became a sergeant myself, but um, but I never had a white, a black officer. Did, did you notice? Oh, except one time when when uh, B. O. Davis came because there was uh, there was a um, uh, there was a, a charge that somebody had killed a white guy in town, and so we had to line up to be identified. And Bill Davis came and mediated that particular situation. That's the only time I ever saw a black officer. Did you notice any differentiation in terms of um, discipline? Uh, were black soldiers more likely to be disciplined, even in uh, a segregated uh, situation? Well, there were more. There were certainly more in, in the guardhouse. See, I don't know. Since we were separate, I don't know how the discipline was applied in uh, in the different a different squadron. But there were, I can say that in the guardhouse, there were more blacks in there than there were. Even though we only had now a wing, I mean, um, on a basic a wing uh, consists of maybe let's see, if I, uh, eight times one hundred sixty-four, about a thousand men. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, we only had one squadron, so that was 164 men. So often there would be more men from that 164 who would be in the guardhouse than there would be whites in the guardhouse, I can say that. But I can't, <coughs> excuse me, I can't, I don't know the dis what the discipline practices were. We didn't have a lot, really we didn't have a, a lot of reasons to be um, disciplined. There was, there was one guy who was a, who was a great athlete, uh, but, uh, and he didn't want to yield, so he would he would go out in the, in the woods and just catch snakes, yeah, and and uh, and they put him in the guardhouse because he refused to uh, just do the dirty work sometimes around, and uh, but uh, but that was the only that's the only personal experience I had in terms of a person uh, going to the guardhouse. Uh, three we, three day passes sometimes were unequally. Uh, allowed, mm -hmm. if you ask him about that, but um, but I don't know the, d the details now of the discipline in other squadrons. Um, when you did receive a pass, were there restrictions placed on your pass that you can't go here, mile. but you can't go there? Well, oh, you can. Well, remember the the, the whole society was de was segregated. So the so you if you were going to a club, you know, there was there were definite clubs that you could go to and clubs that you couldn't. But they all but I, I can say that um, that for the three day pass for the squadron that I was in at Tyndall Field, the limits were 150 miles, okay. which we violated quite often. <laughs> and so because uh, I would come to Atlanta mm -hmm. from Tyndall Field, and uh, but. Um, uh, beyond that, I don't know the, that there was. In the Philippines, though, were there places that were um, off limits for black troops as opposed to? 
white troops. There were some, okay. but that that was often violated by us in their fights. <laughs> we had we had many many fights. In fact, the matter is, um, uh, we were, the uh, squad 1964 a aviation depot company uh, squadron was under attack by uh, some other white units, um, and and we and we stood off the the uh, ch whatever charge it was. But when we filed a complaint about it, they claimed they couldn't find even a gun shell, uh, shell where the firing had taken place. So uh, uh, now I experienced that part myself. But um, the um, uh, and when we were down looking, the, the, I guess we could have found evidence. We didn't know what evidence to look for, totally. But um, uh, that's. But we had those; those occurred quite often. Okay. Yeah. So I saw. I call them the internal skirmishes mm -hmm. that took place. Okay. Yeah. And uh, almost in in Manila, uh, of course, the places everybody could come to Manila. The, uh, the Philippines didn't place the limit on who could come, and invariably there would be turmoil sometimes there. Yeah. So you spent. Um how many months in the military then? Uh, in the military, I spent two hundred, about two hundred, two years and eight months. Okay, two years and eight months, and then um, upon discharge, um, what were the options available to you? Well, I, I took all these. Uh, you know, and then when you come out, you take all these uh, uh, different tests mm -hmm. and uh, for career. Opportunities and so forth. So the guy ends up. He says to me, he said, "Well, he said, you know, you'd make a good preacher." Mm -hmm. I looked at him like, "What?" <laughs> My children have heard this story, <laughs> they, uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, so so the recommendations, you know, that could come for for training were somewhat limited because of the way that the. Uh, the uh, aptitude testing occurred mm -hmm. and what they reported to be the outcomes. Now, uh, later on, I know that, I, that that was an area that I became uh, not fairly knowledgeable about. Um, I know that you can manipulate the, the scores as, as you see fit and categorize them as you see fit. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, so I think that if I had to say that Men who were not highly motivated, who came out of the military, black men, often were discouraged from uh, from advancing to where they might have been advanced, simply because the uh, their aptitude scores they they reported did not send them. I know that with my own, I don't know how he arrived that I could be a good preacher. <laughs> That's, well, we won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, obviously, you faced choices. You um, had to reintegrate yourself right. into the society coming from the, coming mm -hmm. the war uh, arena. So, uh, how did you negotiate that? Was it more education, or did yeah, you well, I would. I, you know, I, I often say that an unknown um, desire I had was to go to Tuskegee, mm -hmm. and that's where I did. I went to Tuskegee after the war, after the war mm -hmm. on the GI Bill. Majoring in? No, I, I started out. I was, my intent was to go there for two years. I, I was in a hurry. Now, uh, I don't know whether I, I do think that the army helped me grow up, but it's also helped me set a, a somewhat of a social distance between where I was educationally. And where others were educationally when I came out, for example, I was, they were 18 and now I'm 21, mm -hmm. and it, I felt like I was an old man compared to them, and so I was, I was in, and so I said I'm, I'm not going to spend four years, I'm going to spend two years. So I went in, to, I, I went for the, the they had a department called Mechanical Industries, so I, I, I was aimed for printing, mm -hmm. and so with, I, I worked, I did an internship with the Atlanta World. Uh, out of the printing uh, for, uh, back in 1946, seven, something like that. And um, 
And, and at the end of the first year, fortunately for me, there were two men, Dr. Fuller and Dr. Reed, who said to me, boy, you don't need to be here for two years. You need to get a degree. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, I, said I can't stay here for four years. They said, well, I said, I said and I, I gave them the excuse that I don't have the, I didn't get the courses I needed for this year. They said, well, you come here this summer and we'll make sure that you get them. That, and that's really how they, they, and I've been thankful, I've been thankful to those two men for uh, forever for their guidance that summer. They made sure, it was tough that summer, but they made sure I got all the courses that I was supposed to have had during that first year. So the second year, I went in equal to anybody who had gone, gone, gone for a four-year program. And so that's how I happened to go, in, to go on toward the degree. I mean, otherwise, I would have been a printer, I guess a printer uh, throughout uh, my career because uh, and, and now even then, printing required uh, manipulation. You ask about how you manipulate, because you couldn't enter the printing uh, uh, union in Atlanta. You had to go, and the only way you had, could get in the printer's union at that time was to go through Denver. And they were admitting black men, and then you could go, once you got in the union, you could go any place and work. But you couldn't go any place and work. So. So little did I realize that, that that barrier also stood there at that time. Of course, you know, it doesn't, it's not there now, but, but it, it was there then. So did you ever consider becoming a reporter, writer? No, I, no, I didn't, not okay. uh, that. But, I, but later on, I, I, I finished uh, uh, actually in education, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, I became a teacher in, uh, in uh, well, well, let me start up. Before I finished the, the four year, uh, I took an exam for the postal transportation, which was an old railway mail. And I took, a, at the rea as a railway mail clerk, I worked for three years. At the end of the second year, I wanted to go back to Tuskegee, but I'd been kind of a irritant, I guess, on campus, you might say, because I, I would raise questions about things that, that I would like attending the Alabama Student Council on Civil Rights that the, Dr. Patterson, who was the president at the time, called me in to say that, that I was, uh, by doing that, I, I was threatening that funding from the state, see. And so when I w wanted to come back, they said, no, you can't come back to finish. So I didn't, I officially didn't finish at Tuskegee, even though I'm considered an alumni now. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, finished at, at uh, Kent State okay. in Ohio, mm -hmm. um, and I finished in uh, in uh, I, my, uh, I finished in education, and then went on to do uh, counseling uh, uh, and psychology. So mm -hmm. that's what I end up uh, as a career. Mm -hmm. Let me jump back so I can kind of pull the two ends together here. <coughs> um, recall our conversation about the community right. and the expectations the community have on mm -hmm. you and your behavior and uh, we talked about achievement mm -hmm. as you had to be trained to do something you could not not do anything right. you know, as part of the norm of the community and then we talked a little bit about um, the military mm -hmm. and the types of uh, military occupational skills that you brought yeah. to bear mm -hmm. so can you kind of give me a sense of whether, uh, how all these things moving forward um, contributed to making you the man that you became? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that taught me that, that, that I'm still, I have a, I met my wife in, a, in a Columbus, Ohio. I, the way I happened to come to Columbus was that I, had to, I was teaching in Cleveland, and I, it's, I fought to get um, elementary counseling in the schools in Cleveland. And so, in many ways, I'm responsible for getting elementary counseling in the state of Ohio. Um, the State Department of, Ohio, of Education then came to seek me to come to Columbus to start elementary counseling across the state. 
But it's, it, it's interesting how the same pattern of racial divide occurs at many different levels. Um, because when I got there, the uh, State Department didn't have a position for elementary counseling. They had hired, they'd already hired me. A salary was in place and everything. And, um, and uh, so I became, I became the supervisor of measurement and evaluation. So I had to, now I had to shift to learn t uh, testing and evaluation and things. And that's how I met my wife. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful because she was working for the um, Columbus Public Schools. And, um, and the, uh, she and a team of people who were on special assignment through Ohio State came down to, to learn something about testing. And, and so I was appointed to be their, their uh, uh, consultant that day. <coughs> Excuse me, and that's how I met Barbara, which is a story that she has to tell you about otherwise. But, uh, but uh, the, um, and so I remained there. And, and in spite of my title, I got elementary counseling in Columbus, Cincinnati, Dayton, and 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 some of the small schools, but but uh, uh, that's how elementary counseling got into Ohio. Uh, at the time that I started, the elementary counseling was only in the, only in the schools of of Florida. They had they had elementary counseling, and uh, so I've been grateful for the opportunity to do to do that. Uh, but as, and then as a psychologist and uh, and uh, I taught in in counseling and, eva and evaluation at Ohio State for for uh, 18 years, I guess you said. I'm reported 18 years. So uh, and and I now all those things, all the time that those things were going on, also did community work. And so I. I uh, because I always believed that, that if we could get communities to, to work together, that things could happen. So in, in, uh, in Columbus, Ohio, I, I, I've left, uh, started a, uh, two institutions, two, one, one that doesn't exist uh, totally, but one that, is, one that uh, still exists there and, 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 has, and hires at least 20 Five or thirty people. Um, that's the Afrocentric Personal Development Shop. It is a mental health, uh, uh, alcohol and drug center that um, that um, been there now for thirty years, I think, something like that. And uh, I passed it on to a younger person, mm -hmm. and it still exists. And I came here. I've been working in the, in my in my home community, mm -hmm. Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. and with the with the uh, with RAC, the Richard Allen Classic Group, that that's really working to make sure that that uh, that uh, Marsh Brown mm -hmm. stays alive. Mm -hmm. So, uh, mm -hmm. so those are some of the things that I've been doing, and how, and I think my my background in Pittsburgh helped make me know that it was necessary to work in the community. Mm -hmm. Part of this exercise <coughs> in capturing the past is to present a perspective and a story for future generations predicated on what has happened with the hopes of getting them to understand what could be. Mm -hmm. And um, when you look at the totality of your life and the things that you have been exposed to, the things that you were able to do relative to your background and your training, what would be the message that you would give to the younger generation mm -hmm. about their needs to get, quote, unquote, an act together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you know, it's kind of interesting. We, we were talking, I think, I think we were talking at lunch about that. The, um, and I, I may have said this to you, too, that uh, one of the things that troubles me right now is that there's such a disconnect between uh, intergenerationally, and so and so, um, uh, often I say that in order to help young people, I have to start with elders, because 
elders were the ones that passed the wisdom down and passed the mores and for, uh, folkways down to to the uh, to uh, young people. But but now we've kind of gotten our little turf, and we um, um, maintain that little turf without any interaction across those turfs to ensure that we have become, can become powerful enough to, to maintain the, the, the values that we, that we have with our young. But I think that the same values that I was taught need to be retaught, but it can't be retaught because it, that interruption sometimes in, in the religious uh, uh, doctrines that teach individualism, there's a, there's a, in schools, uh, in corporations, and all, and so so we have uh, somehow or other, I think that we we have to begin to address that, so that we can teach what is has sustained us in times of great uh, deprivation. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't that doesn't mean that we have that elders have not passed have not done things that they should do. But I'm talking about what I think needs to be done at this point in time. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the things that I've always been aware of and which is kind of always put out there is that your generation was the greatest generation. That um, the things that we enjoy as a democracy um, was forged in the sacrifices that your generation has, has made and made it possible for us then to enjoy a, a lifestyle and uh, a, a world perspective that we would not have had had not those sacrifices been made. Um, and so it's, your story is important for us to put it all into context and, and, and to be informative about what we need to understand foundationally uh, moving into the future. And what I'm hearing you say is that um, uh, that connection while there needs to be strengthened in order for the, that message to be mm -hmm. fully yeah. translated and, right. and owned. Right. Um, and I think that, you know, <coughs> I don't know if you're old enough to remember the... Uh, I'm 72. <laughs> well, that, you, may, you may not. You may not be. That's twenty. See, that 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 means that I'm about twenty nine years old, mm -hmm. older than you. Um, when the churches had a women's corner, or where all all the senior women sat, and and which uh, almost nothing took place without their approval. Now, um, um, the preachers can say what they want to say, but they, without their approval, not much took place. And and um, and and we, so that got destroyed, and so that kind of influence is not present. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember men at the barber shop who would make who would make decisions about what was going to happen down the block. Uh, that that you know when I got in the barber shop now they're talking about the. No. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so, so, so that, no, we don't don't have that in place, mm -hmm. and uh, and so I'm I'm now I'm just talking about in, all, formal organizations, informal organizations, that um, that uh, are not not participating in decision making that would be beneficial to all, and part of it has to do. With, uh, with the uh, young people thought of not believing that there's a place for uh, seniors because you out of t we out of touch mm -hmm. with the, what, what the realities of the day are, not realizing what you as you said that that the contributions have been made that that enable them to be even in that position, and but that bond is not there to keep it in place for their children, and so uh, I'm concerned about that. I'm really concerned about that, and 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 everywhere, well, Fred knows everywhere I am. That's a message that I try to deliver, because um, I don't see. I think that we can't blame anybody for anything now. That we need to uh, just strengthen the bonds that we know that worked, mm -hmm. and then and then if somebody comes against that, then protect ourselves from that. I, don't, I mean, I don't think you back down from anything. But 
but we need to have that in place so the protection can be valid, mm -hmm. you know. And so uh, that, that's... You might have alluded to it. I, I was trying to pick up on it. I wanted to, to press you on that. But to what extent does an Afrocentric perspective help to clarify and to promote? Well, I think that, that you know, it's kind of interesting. I've been, I've, there was a time in my life when I would emphasize that that, 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 was, that it should be F, AFRI instead of AFRO. Okay. And um, and it, and it kind of, in a way that kind of ties with ties into your, your question, the the um, AFRO says that it's here. Mm -hmm. AFRI says that it's tied to a, a whole set of values that precedes here. Okay. That's that's that, that that's Kelsey's you know interpretation now. So so take take that with a grain of salt. Uh, but. Uh, uh, but I, but that's kind of what I think is very important that that wh whichever you choose, that is uh, that we need to be talking about values that we know have been long lasting as the cultural blueprint, as opposed to those things that have come into into vogue to to represent a a shallowness of newness as being the value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Very interesting. So, you've had the perspective of 90 plus years. Mm -hmm. um, what wisdom have you pulled in that you might share beyond what you have given us already? Well, those are a lot of years. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I, I'd say take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> take care of yourself. Uh, uh, and taking care of yourself doesn't mean individually taking care of yourself. That uh, t taking care of yourself means you share that taking care of yourself with, with others. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, uh, and, and a proverb that I often use that, that, uh, that uh, recognizes that you can't do that just uh, quickly, is that he who has patience will eat ripe fruit. So if you got patience, uh, uh, that that can produce f a very well for you. But uh, but if you're looking for an instant gratification, you're probably not going to go very far. A little bit about your family background. You've alluded to it. Uh, yeah, well, marriage and children. Yeah, I've got got three beautiful children. <laughs> okay. And and what are they doing? Well, two of them are physicians, and and one is a, is a promoter of, of, of medical products. I guess you'd have to call it. Uh, who uh, two are here in Atlanta? The, the reason that we part, there are a couple of reasons we're back in Atlanta. One is because they our two daughters left Columbus, Ohio, to come to Spelman, and went to med school and. Never came back. Came, back. <laughs> and 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 the second one is that uh, that uh, uh, we came back because I had grown up here. Mm -hmm. But uh, the um, my son is in Raleigh, and um, he's they all are doing pretty well. We uh, I'm talking to my daughter this morning, and I said to, to her now. You know, I, it's time for me to step back and not be as involved as I am. We were talking about the pre Kwanzaa uh, a workshop that, that we're going to have this year. And I said, and you're going to take leadership for that. And she said, okay, okay. I said, fine, fine. I said, it's time. I said, I'll be there, but, but do you, you'll take leadership. And I think, I think that, that, that we have to know, too, as elders, we have to know when it's time to pass the baton. Any grandchildren? Yeah, we got the the youngest one is two years one. We two years old in January. Okay. okay. And she's exciting. Okay. She's really exciting. We got got the uh, let's see, it's a thirteen year old. Uh, two that are thirteen now. Twelve. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, thirteen, twelve, nine, and seven. And 
and uh, one will be two years in January. And I have I have a, uh, a grandson that uh, from previous marriage that was here. He lives in California, and he was here for for Thanksgiving, and uh, it was a wonderful time. Right, great. Uh, well, are there any words of wisdom, parting words of wisdom that you want before we? <laughs> well, I just say thanks for this interview. I hope that it. Um, uh, share some light on some things that that I have not seen uh, written as much as I would like to see explored. The um, I, I, I really would like to see more explored about uh, some of the hardships that some of the men experienced in the military because um, um, that story is not told. In spite of that, those men accomplished one, some, some wonderful things. and, and uh, and uh, I don't think that's, that story has been told very well, and so I appreciate what you're doing. Well, we're certainly pleased that you have taken this time to spend with us mm -hmm. further exploration mm -hmm. of those questions so that when history is, as they say, writ again, <laughs> that they will capture and mm -hmm. not lose these fragments um, that, that are out there. Mm -hmm. It's very important that, mm -hmm. that all be knitted together in a, a, a more cohesive way. Okay. Okay. Can I ask just a couple of questions? Yes. Just a couple of quick questions, um, Dr. Kelsey. Do you recall where you were and how you felt when you heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor? Well, I, I, I didn't know what that was all about, to tell the truth. Um, the, uh, um, and I wondered, how could you get so far from Japan to to uh, to, uh, to to Hawaii uh, with a, a bomb attack and get back safely? Um, and and there were great debates about who was attacking who. No, in my and I remember that now I'm back in Atlanta and Pittsburgh, where where um, where where we didn't shy away from discussing. Some, some matters that might not be considered to be a patriotic as, as a, some others, yeah. And sort of wrapped along in with that, you were in the Pacific. Do you hmm. recall how you felt and when you heard about the atomic bombs being dropped? How did that? Well, I, I, well, I still think that that was a, a, a crime against humanity. I still think that. And uh, so I, I still feel that way, and uh, and and I, the audacity that we have to tell somebody they can't have one. I mean, it's a, it's, I think is a, I think that's a. Uh, I mean, how you do that when you've already murdered some people unnecessarily? So that's. And just one last quick one, I'm sorry. You mentioned that you were told at Tuskegee that your civil rights activities were kind of putting the school in jeopardy. Can yeah. you tell us a little bit about those activities? Well, um, there was a, first place, there was a guy, I can't remember his name now, a white guy whose name escapes me right now, who had been organizing civil rights groups in in uh, in Alabama and he had been he had been a, a he was labeled as a communist uh, whether he was a communist or not I don't know anything about that but uh, oh, I wish I could remember his name um, and uh, so when we the the the, the, the the, this particular conference was held at Talladega, so I went up to Talladega to this conference, and and I already been, had been on the in the paper in the in the Tuscaloosa, which was a newspaper of college. I'd been writing articles about how, how I thought students were being mis uh, been exploited by the the across the street was some stores that I called, that was called a block, and how I thought that they were being exploited, and and I didn't know at the time that some of the faculty and others own some of those places. And, uh, and, and, and then when I went up to this particular 
conference with, I guess that was that was a great opportunity to tell me that listen, you better stop all this stuff. And um, uh, but as far as I know, there was no nothing came out of that that would have been harmful to anybody. You know, out of that particular conference, um, it told it the the talk was about how do you gain power and, and move out of this uh, uh, oppressive state that you're in. And then, and um, uh, it looks like the guy's name was Russell. I'm trying to think of this person's name, but uh, uh, but that's that. Uh, but there was never any reason other than, and 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 I think it was a valid reason. Now I think Dr. Patterson was absolutely correct that if if that if my activity got highlighted, that he would loot the state of Alabama would withdraw its funds. I'm 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 confident that that's correct. So I don't think he was sending out a, a false balloon. Mm. Let me pursue a question that you had asked. So you had mentioned that uh, in the conversation in the black community it seemed to differ about perspective on the war in the Pacific. What was the perspective on the war in Europe? relative to? We didn't have nothing to do with it. Okay. That I'm, I'm, I'm talking about our community now. I'm talking about the community right there, the community that fits where it, and we didn't have nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, of course, you know, in the infantry now, there were, black, there were many black soldiers that were in the infantry and went to Europe, many, mm -hmm. and who fought, um, who used uh, a front. I'll just say it that way. But uh, and we thought that was uh, and 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 of course there was great no, you know we felt like there was nothing we could do about it, mm -hmm. but but uh, we didn't feel like that was our argument uh, that that had much to do with the with our community. And then, you no, know, I think we need to talk about that subject sometimes again now. Mm -hmm. What some of these things have to do with us? Mm -hmm. Interesting to be pursued. <laughs> <laughs> I think that we okay, have, well, I, I we appreciate have course that. for yeah, the afternoon yeah. and again thank you thank it's you. been most informative and uh, um, we will see that you get a copy of this alright <laughs> all right. thank you thank you thank, thank you for your service and for all you continue to do yeah well, thank you